And uh, without further ado, I would like to um, introduce, start introducing Professor Richard Parker. He is going to start in two minutes. Uh, so he is uh, an amazing um, human being and uh, a professor at um, uh, the University of Brighton. Uh, he also organizes uh, a range of meetings. Uh, and uh, that's uh, where I kind of started uh, my um, uh, journey in uh, aging research. Uh, that's where we met uh, 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 at Brighton uh, with Kristen Fortney for the first time. She was still at the University of Toronto. Uh, and the many, many people who are uh, now department heads uh, or laboratory uh, heads uh, uh, also were at these meetings. Um, Professor Faraher uh, studies Werner syndrome, uh, and many of his publications uh, are in Werner syndrome. Actually, the University of Brighton has a wonderful tool called the fingerprint, which allows you to see the core academic uh, focus areas of the scientist. So uh, Professor Faraher did a lot of work in Werner, uh, looks at cell aging, uh, uh, looked at telomeres, telomerase, uh, all kinds of progerias. Um, and published uh, seminal works uh, in that field. He is also on the board of directors of the American Federation of Aging Research, uh, a nonprofit, uh, and he is involved uh, with the American Aging Association, uh, one of the top authorities uh, in the Werner syndrome. Actually, uh, in Silicon Medicine, my uh, uh, main company uh, is focused on uh, WRN uh, protein as well, so one of the targets also involved in synthetic lethality. Uh, and uh, Professor Faraker also wrote abundantly on uh, aging, uh, is a very popular figure, populist as well, uh, contributes to, the, to many outreach initiatives. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce him. And I think right now we can start, right? I guess we'll find out. The, uh, I, I will uh, do my best to share a screen, which I ought to be able to do. I can't see my own. Aha, that looks like the one that we need to have. Okay. Let me just take that. And yeah, and just the screen. There we go. Start presenting. Okay. Can everybody see that? All right. Um, yeah. I would just like to say thank you to the organizers for inviting me, and thank you to the sponsors for covering this meeting. It's a real delight in times as challenging as those in which we live now to see how aging research is capturing the imagination of communities and how many people are interested. You know, I hope these meetings continue to go from strength to strength. What I'm going to talk to you about over the next sort of 15 to 20 minutes um, is this reversal of cell senescence by resveralogs from novel mechanisms to new therapies. I actually prefer my alternative title, which is what I started with, which is a tale of bogus science. And I'll show you what I mean. The whole of ARDD's conference remit is according to one of the most famous epidemiologists of the 20th century, Bogus. In a famous article in the British Medical Journal, Richard Dahl, who is the um, epidemiologist responsible for showing the link between smoking and lung cancer, decided that he would make the announcement that there is no such thing as aging. That it's a, um, and what he in fact said was that the fact that lots of adult diseases arise in the same part of the lifespan is not good evidence that they have similar underlying mechanisms. It's not good evidence that there's a single unifying change or mechanism that could probably be called aging. I always the thing I always love about this article is that it was accompanied by a picture of him, and there you can see he's clearly 85 and hasn't aged today. Okay, but what was this gentleman? thinking? What was his mental model? Because Doll's not a fool. And what was going through his mind, I think, was something like this, where people start off healthy and they become sick. So they start off without cardiovascular disease and there's a process and they get it. They start off without cancer, 
There's a different process, they get that. They start off without Alzheimer's disease. There's another process, they get that. And so on, pretty much ab nauseum. And this would be a reasonable example of deduction from epidemiological data. And Dahl is unquestionably one of the greatest epidemiologists who ever lived. Where this sort of rattled people was whilst that would have been a reasonable thing to say in the late 60s, by the late 90s, it was a position that was pretty much untenable to hold. And it had been so for at least a decade. The model I've just shown you has some very strong predictions, which is that if every pathology of late and middle life has a distinct cause, then making a single change shouldn't cure or cause more than one disease. And that was difficult to square with observations coming out of the aging research community, beginning with the pioneering work of Michael Klass in the 1980s, carrying on through the contributions of Cynthia Kenyon and Tom Johnson. It was proving ever more possible and ever easier to isolate single gene mutants, first in C. elegans and then subsequently in Drosophila, which showed greatly extended healthy lifespans. It was also difficult to square, from my own personal perspective, with the things I worked on. Th this is Werner's syndrome. Um, <clears throat> for the avoidance of doubt, the gentleman with Werner's syndrome is the gentleman on the right. The gentleman on the left simply has a weight problem and a really bad 1980s tie that I don't wear anymore. What makes this comparison interesting and informative is that we are both the same age pretty much where that photo was taken. It was taken when we were both about 32. Okay, and if you are unfortunate enough to have Werner's syndrome, you have a single gene mutation and you develop a very wide range of phenotypic manifestations that are highly reminiscent of what you see when normal people age. So on the one hand, you have a single genetic change that seems to slow down multiple aspects of aging because it makes the these make the organisms much healthier. And you have single genetic changes that compromise the survival of the organism and compromise it in ways that look spookily reminiscent of what happens to wild type humans as they age. And so I could go on and on with evidence saying that this model is not reflective of the real biology of aging. It doesn't look like this. It looks much more, I think we now understand, like this, where we have a few aging mechanisms that cause the things we think of as the diseases of aging, the things we find difficult to classify, like, for example, immune senescence. And taken together, these cause mortality and morbidity, which is what we're trying to get rid of. And this is quite a hopeful slide because it suggests that targeting just a few pathways should allow us to target multiple late life pathologies and impairments with a single hit. What are the pathways? This image that I'm showing you now has probably been shared more than more times than I would care to mention. It's a little codified image of what were thought to be the major pathways some years ago. It is not definitive. This is not the Haynes, um, Haynes manual for the human body or indeed for any other organism. It's simply a useful ontology. And as I will show you in a few slides time, it's relatively incomplete. But rather than there being hundreds of different plausible mechanisms, there are only really a few. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about one of them, tumor suppression mechanisms. And to do this, I want to go back to the beginnings of tissue culture. There's a gentleman called, there's a, the father of tissue culture, a gentleman called Alexis Carell. He undertook the first systematic cell culture experiments. He used chicken cells. And what he purported to have discovered was that they could be grown indefinitely. Now he wasn't primarily interested in aging, but his findings were potentially valuable to people who were. Because if cells never stop dividing, then loss of divisional capacity can't cause aging because it doesn't happen. There was only one thing wrong with this work of Corral's, and the thing that was wrong with it was that it was wrong. It turned out to be artifactual. 
And in the 1960s, Len Hayflick, doing the same kinds of studies, but much more carefully, demonstrated that metazoan cells, human fibroblasts, do have finite limits to division. He called this senescence. He realized it reopened the question of divisional limits as a cause of aging, but also, and crucially, simplified a fundamental question in cancer biology, which was what was the difference between a cancer cell and a normal cell. If cancer cells have lost divisional limits, that's a clear difference between them and normal mortal cells that do have them. And the response to this, and I am glissading over about 30 years of argument, was to say senescence is a tissue culture artifact, senescence is bogus. It's quite difficult, looking back from the point of view of today, to realize quite how unenthusiastically these ideas were received initially. What actually is senescence? It's simply a viable state of cell cycle arrest in cells that are normally proliferation competent. Senescent cells show different phenotypes compared to their growth competent pre precursors. Senescence is not cell death, and it's not terminal differentiation either in situations where you can sort these out. It exists almost certainly as a tumor suppression mechanism. There's very good evidence for that now. And it occurs in a kinetically highly distinct way, which is often overlooked, which is rather than, for example, in a population of cells growing in culture, rather than all the cells in the population dividing in synchrony 20, 30, 40, 50 times and then stopping, there is a gradual loss of the growth fraction, which means that most, cell, most cultures of primary cells, if you've grown them for a while, will be mixtures of cells that can grow and cells that are senescent. And you neglect this at your peril if you're trying to understand what's going on. How does senescence work? Well, it wouldn't be a scientific conference if I didn't give you a semi-incomprehensible flowchart to show how much cleverer I am than you. Okay, there are innumerable variants of this, but that represents the core mechanisms. And it's not hugely relevant to the story I want to tell. It just needs to be in there. Crucially, senescent cells have really distinct patterns of gene expression compared to cells that can grow but aren't. Those different patterns of gene expression give rise to radically different phenotypes, which affect things such as invasiveness, um, such as the, their ability to remodel the matrix, and in turn, those really different phenotypes give a large potential to interfere with the tissue balance in an intact organism. I think it's important to, to stress, because this often gets lost in conversation, that senescence between cell types is pretty variable. Okay, you can see um, phenotypes that in one cell type that simply don't exist in another. For example, some years ago, we demonstrated that senescent vascular smooth muscle cells forget that they're smooth muscle cells to be anthropomorphic. They transdifferentiate into bone cells. And also some of the features that are listed as canonical to senescent cell types, such as the senescence associated secretory phenotype, aren't found everywhere. If you look in the senescent cells of your cornea, for example, you will not see a cesp. You will, however, see a range of other changes in gene expression that will compromise the ability of your cornea to do its job. Okay, and returning to my first love of Werner syndrome, one plausible cause of the phenotype that you can see of accelerated aging is that if you look at fibroblasts derived from patients with Werner's syndrome, they have about the same capacity to regenerate as you would find in a population of cells from a mouse. And crucially, tissues that do not show pathologies associated with aging do not show this compromised ability to proliferate. I don't have time to talk about that much though I would like to. Probably the best evidence that senescent cells really do do bad things is the famous um, transgenic mouse work from the Van Drusen and Kirkland labs. It's been put out for a few years now, where it shows two things. 
look, the, firstly, that senescent cells can compromise survival and, and physiology. And secondly, and more importantly, that if you remove them, you see improvements in a wide range of physiological parameters. I particularly like this data, which is my little cartoon of it, which is voluntary wheel running. If you delete senescent cells, these animals run about twice as far and about twice as fast. And nobody is making these animals run. They're running just because they feel better. And so this gives rise to this kind of overarching model for how senescence is contributing to organismal aging. In the normal course of your life, you're losing cells. That loss is balanced by cell division. Cell division makes senescent cells. Bad stuff happens when they build up. It also gives rise to what I might call the senolytic promise, which is if we kill senescent cells, can we do in humans what's being done in mice, in transgenic mice? And that would be an enormous bonus if we could. All I've done there is I've scaled the mouse data and it would be the difference between people who are in care homes, not able to live independently, and an older person who's jogging down to the shop to get the newspaper, pushing young people out the way because they've got somewhere to go. And there's rapid progress being made towards that goal. We are at the beginnings of that process and there will be many pitfalls along the way because of the complexities of the senescent phenotypes that I've tried to sketch out to you. Key question for me is, are there other ways to achieve the same result? Do we actually need to delete senescent cells or can we do something else? And the entry point into this for me was the work of a collaborator, Lorna Harries. This is one of Lorna's slides. She was interested looking in a human cohort, the Inchianti population, in which pathways changed as that population aged. And Lorna pounced on the observation that RNA splicing and RNA processing were two of the pathways most altered in aging. Okay, for those of you who remember your um, sort of second year cell biology, as you may well know in eukaryotic organisms, once an RNA transcript is made, it can be spliced into a wide variety of different forms, giving you different proteins. This is under the control of a highly complex regulatory network, upwards of 200 different proteins and HNRMPs, all right? And what had caught Lorna's attention, which was why she spoke to me, was a paper she'd come across showing that resveratrol altered RNA splicing in cancer cell lines. And about the time that she'd done this, I'd just contributed to a report um, for the insurance industry on potential interventions in aging. And somebody else, it wasn't me, was interviewed and made the famous quote, resveratrol is bogus. And it turned out that not only was I working in a bogus field of aging on a bogus area of cell senescence, I had a student who was very keen to work on resveratrol and I was working on a bogus molecule. And so what that student did together with my longstanding collaborator, Lizzie Osler, was pioneer a new synthetic route for molecules that were based on a resveratrol backbone. And we call these res um, resveralogs. Um, the synthetic route is very straightforward and it produces pure compounds in excellent yields. So it's very suitable for library approaches. Together with Lorna, we did a very, very interesting experiment. We took a range of these compounds that we had tuned. So for example, as many people will know, resveratrol um, is often considered canonically to be a surf activator. We had resveratrol, uh, resveratrol analogs that had no capacity to activate CERT1. And we simply took a range of these, carefully chosen, and in essence, we poured them onto senescent cells, and we looked at the splicing factor changes to see what happened, and we looked at the senescent cells to see what happened. And what we found was this. We could tweak the SASP in these cells in various different ways, and that was important. The compounds we chose all reverse splicing factor changes, and they all reversed senescence. Populations of cells that were senescent 
were now no longer senescent, they would start dividing again. And this was unexpected, I'll be honest. We spent a lot of time pinning these effects down to make sure that they were not um, senolytics or paracrine senescent in inhibition. And we were helped in this by the fact we had the library. We couldn't have done this, you know, just with resveratrol or dihydrorosveratrol. So we have a panel of compounds that will reverse senescence. Those cells will proliferate. And so potentially we have another approach here. Rather than simply deleting senescent cells, can we turn them back into useful members of the workforce? It's the difference between having to fire an employee and hopefully being able to re-motivate him or her to do their job again. What have we done since then? Well, this paper is, is just out, so I'll just run you briefly through the, the main points of it. We did a lot of mining of the effects of our compounds on growth and senescence. Okay, I've always wanted to give to present a table like this at a meeting. It's what I call my real scientist table, where you have something dreadfully boring and someone says, as is obvious from the 17 columns on the extreme right. We looked at which chemical changes altered which properties of the molecule. And we looked at which of our molecules in our library would rescue senescence. And it turned out a very large number of them do. You will see the control values are there. They are about fourth or fifth from the right. Okay, so it turns out a lot of these compounds can rescue senescence. We also found out the compounds that kill, um, that kill cells induce senescence. This is potentially useful. And compounds that activate SIRT1, even though SIRT1 activation is not required, you can rescue senescence without activating SIRT1. But if you activate SIRT1, you get an additive senescence rescue effect. And so simply to conclude, minor modifications to resveratrol will alter the biological activities of compounds derived from them. This is really useful. There seem to be quite a range of ways in which you can rescue senescence. Cert one activators are better, and this provides a lot of potential to tailor the effects we're seeing to different cell types and different locations. I would stress that there are occasions where you would not wish to use a senolytic. The obvious question, the obvious one for me would be the endothelial layer of the cornea. Okay, these resveralogs may represent a route to intervention there. On the flip side, CERT1 inhibition may itself represent a useful strategy for the prevention of tumor growth. And the last point, as Alex kind of alluded to in the introduction, I seem to have been around in this field longer than I thought I would be. And looking back over 35 odd years of this, my suggestion, I suppose, would be if you want a difficult career, but if you want something, some way of making your name, do consider working on things that the big names of the, of the time loudly dismiss as bogus. So it remains me only to thank the organizers and to thank you and to pray to God I can use Slack. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Really fa uh, fantastic talk. We have uh, quite a lot of questions on Slack that I will read for you, so you don't have to go to Slack right now. You can do oh, it later. Oh, thank God for that. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, the most upvoted is from Anne Equi. I, I'm sorry if I mispronounced the name. Borak so, Farragher is mispronounced all the time, yes. frequently as Farage, which I'm afraid does not necessarily endear me to the people who do that. <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> and so Anne asks, if cells become senescent because of accumulating damage, wouldn't it be dangerous to allow them to divide again without repairing them? Okay, it's an interesting, it's an interesting point. Um, because it's kind of, okay, it's actually an interesting point because it's two questions in one. It presupposes that cells become senescent by accumulating damage, okay? Now, and that in turn um, isn't necessarily the case. If you think of telomere shortening as damage, 
It's very selective damage because it's only taking place at the telomere. And what we think is going on with these compounds, and I, I didn't have time to go into this, but what we think is going on with these compounds is we think they are transiently activating both telomerase and factors that allow template access. So when you add these compounds, you have a short telomere, you turn telomerase on very transiently, you, um, you then repair the telomere, and the cell starts to divide again. We have actually done these experiments where we've added these compounds and we've then taken them away. And this because we were curious about whether we'd start to see escape from senescence or things like this. We don't. What happens is that effect remains in place until the compound's tagged out and then it goes. What this also means is I would be astonished if these compounds rescued senescence in absolutely all cell types, absolutely everywhere. So in a situation where you did have, say, a load of damage within the genome, I'm not so sure that works. It's a very perceptive question, but it brings in quite a number of different factors. I hope that answers it. I see. Yeah, very nice. Thank you very much. I think uh, because we're running already quite yeah. a bit over that we will stop here, Richard. But thank you so much for your presentation. It was wonderful. I really hope that you will log on to Slack because then you can... Uh, I'm, rep no, rep I will spend the rest of the afternoon endeavoring <laughs> to do so. Fantastic. Thank you, Thank you very much, Richard. Excellent talk.